beginning in verse 32. Acts 4 and verse 32, it says, All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of his possessions was his own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and much grace was upon them all. There were no needy persons among them, for from time to time those who owned lands or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales, and put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone as he had need. Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, sold a field that he owned, and he brought the money, and he put it at the apostles' feet. Look at chapter 5 and verse 1. Now a man named Ananias, together with his wife Sapphira, also sold a piece of property. With his wife's full knowledge, he kept back part of the money for himself, but brought the rest and put it at the apostles' feet. Then Peter said to Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and have kept for yourself some of the money that you received for the land? Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? What made you think of doing such a thing? You have not lied to men, but to God. When Ananias heard this, he fell down dead, and great fear seized all who heard about what happened. Then the young men came forward, wrapped up his body, and carried him out and buried him. About three hours later, his wife came in. Not knowing what had happened, Peter asked her, Tell me, is this the price that you and Ananias got for the land? Yes, she said, that is the price. Peter said to her, How could you agree to test the spirit of the Lord? Look, the feet of the men who buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out also. At that moment, she fell down and died. Then the young men came in and, finding her dead, carried her out and buried her beside her husband. Great fear seized the whole church and all who heard about these events. Look at verse 12. The apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders among the people. And all the believers used to meet together in Solomon's colonnade, but no one else dared join them, even though they were highly regarded by the people. Nevertheless, more and more men and women believed in the Lord and were added to their number. As a result, people brought the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and mats so that at least Peter's shadow might fall on some of them as he passed by. Crowds gathered also from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing their sick and those tormented by evil spirits, and all of them were healed. All right, let's pray and ask the Holy Spirit to help us this morning. Father, we thank you for this morning. I thank you for the people that you love so much. Thank you for your presence here and your powerful word. Holy Spirit, come and breathe life on your church, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Why do bad things happen in even the best of churches? Why are there conflicts among believers? Conflicts between believers and leaders, and even between leaders and other leaders? Why does sin always manage to find its way into the camp? I wonder some days if Jesus looks at the church and does one of these. I know when he looks at Facebook, he does one of these. You know, a lot of times when we think back on the Book of Acts church, we, we remember it through rose-colored lenses. We remember well their unity. We remember well their generosity of spirit, their fervent prayer. We remember their boldness and the miracles and the explosive growth. But we easily forget the persecution that occurred in 26 out of the 28 chapters in Acts. And we forget that they had internal problems too. Acts chapter 5 contains one of the more troubling incidents in the book of Acts. So troubling, in fact, that some Bible scholars refuse to believe it, and a lot of pastors avoid teaching it. I wonder, just a quick poll, how many of you have ever heard a sermon over the pulpit on Ananias and Sapphira? Let me see your hands if you have. All right, not very many. For all the rest of you, you're about to hear the best sermon then you've ever heard on Ananias and Sapphira. Actually, Luke's inclusion of this story argues for the authenticity and the accuracy 
of the history that he's given us. Luke presents to us a strong and a healthy and a unified and a powerful and a growing church, but not a perfect church. Acts is the journey of a real church with ups and downs, with victories and setbacks, with a variety of human personalities and human failures. Beloved, listen to me and may God give you grace. Even at its very best, the church is always a work of God's grace in progress. Always struggling with persecution from without and with problems inside. But how can we be sure that we're part of the progress and not part of the problems? As I look at the story of Ananias and Sapphira, I find three ways that we can choose progress instead of problems. And I want to share them with you quickly today. Three ways that we can choose progress instead of problems. The first thing that we can do is we can choose generosity toward God. We can choose generosity toward God. In Luke chapter 12, Jesus warned us to be on guard against all kinds of greed and he implored us to choose generosity toward God. Generosity toward God was the joyful response of Zacchaeus when he met Jesus one day under the canopy of a sycamore tree. Zacchaeus freely gave away half of everything that he had to help the poor, and he vowed to repay everyone that he had cheated four times. Generosity toward God was the joyful heart of the forgiven prostitute who burst into a dinner party and washed the feet of Jesus with her tears and let down her hair in public and dried his feet with her hair and then kissed them and lavished expensive perfume on them. And generosity toward God was the joyful heart of the first believers here in the book of Acts. As I look at these verses, there's a few qualities to their giving that stand out to me especially. First of all, I find that they gave voluntarily. Beloved, the early church was neither a commune nor was it communist as some people have supposed. Believers continued to own and they continued to reside in their own homes. And all God's people said, Amen. I love you, but I'm glad I can go home at night. There was no requirement to sell their property or their possessions and give the proceeds to the church, but these believers did so voluntarily. Beloved, generosity toward God is the natural overflow of a fresh experience with Jesus. It's the natural overflow of a fresh encounter with his forgiveness and his grace. Generosity towards God is the natural overflow of a thankful heart, of a loving heart. You see, when people are fresh in love with Jesus, there is never a giving problem. When people are, are fresh in love with Jesus, giving doesn't have to be dictated or demanded. It's not drudgery or hard duty, but it flows freely from grateful hearts. When people are fresh in love with Jesus, they consider everything they possess as belonging to God. Beloved, listen to me. Your possessions are God's belongings. Your possessions are are God's belongings. You might be holding on to them, but God owns them. Can I tell you, God even owns your next breath. It's not guaranteed to you. Ananias discovered that. God literally, it says in Acts 5, took his breath away. He breathed out his last breath and God didn't give him another. The scripture is literally true that says in him we live and move and have our being. Not only did they give voluntarily, but I find that they gave generously, lavishly, in fact. Do you know, as good Jews, the first believers were already in the regular habit of giving the tithe. They were already in the habit of giving the first 10% of their income for the support of the ministry of the temple. And they were also in the habit of giving alms, offerings for the poor. 
During his earthly ministry, Jesus affirmed both tithing and almsgiving as spiritual disciplines that we ought to do. But on top of that, these believers took the extraordinary step of selling their property and their valuable possessions and bringing the proceeds to the church. These were lavish love offerings given to meet the bigger needs of the body. In fact, it says here in Acts 4 that they gave so much that no one among them was in need. Imagine that. It reminds me of the joyful generosity of the Israelites after they had been set free from bondage in Egypt. The Bible says that they brought so much offerings when it was time to build the tabernacle that Moses finally had to tell them to stop enough already. Can you imagine what a great day it would be for both you and me if I could stand up here one day and say, stop, you don't have to bring any more offerings for phase two. It's all done. There's no more need. A third quality, they like that at 8.30. You're not blessed at that prospect. <laughs> Means before I tell you to stop, you've got to bring the offerings, right? A, a third quality of their giving was sincerity. They gave to honor God. They gave to support the ministry of the apostles. They gave to meet the needs of the body. They gave to fund the advance of the gospel. They gave without strings attached. They gave without ulterior motives. Beloved, some people give with an eye to what they might get back, either from God or from men or both. Some people give because one way or another, they believe that it will help them to get ahead. But the early believers gave from a heart overflowing with generosity toward God, voluntarily, lavishly, sincerely. Generosity toward God was what distinguished the poor widow's offering from all the others that Jesus observed one day in the temple. Do you remember the story? Jesus said out of her need, she gave two uh, tiny copper pennies all that she had. Do you know why giving pleases God? It's because giving is an exercise of faith. When we're giving, we're demonstrating that we trust in God more than we trust in the resources in our own hand. Generosity toward God is what distinguished Abel's offering from Cain's. Beloved, can I tell you, when we give, what matters to God is not the size of our offering, but the position of our heart. God rejected Cain's offering because of the contents of his heart. Paul talked about this. He said, if the willingness is there in your heart, then your offering is acceptable according to what you have, not what you don't have. Generosity toward God is the inner inclination in my heart to always give my best to Him, to always give Him the best effort that I can, to always give Him the best of my days and my years, to always offer Him the best of my strength and talent and ability and resources. Generosity toward God is what distinguished Barnabas' offering from Ananias and Sapphira's offering. One of the very important messages from Acts chapter 5 is that God takes our offerings seriously. Beloved, look at me, and may God give you grace. Giving is a spiritual transaction. Giving is a physical act with spiritual outcomes. Giving is an earthly act with heavenly impact. Whether our gifts are large or small, whether they're tithes or alms or missions giving or, or larger gifts to meet the bigger needs of the body, God weighs the sincerity of our heart with every gift that we give. As I compare Barnabas' experience with Ananias and Sapphira's, I find a few ways that generosity toward God leads to progress in our lives. First of all, I find that generosity toward God restores your God-given identity. Generosity toward God restores your God-given identity. Joseph was a Jewish expat who was living on the island of Cyprus. 
It just so happened that year that he came to visit relatives in Jerusalem around the time of Jesus' death and resurrection, and he was there during the feast of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit was poured out. He picked a good year to visit Jerusalem. And while he was there, Joseph from Cyprus met Jesus from Nazareth. And when he met Jesus, his life was transformed and his God-given identity was restored to him. Joseph was a Levite. In the Old Testament, Levites were not supposed to own property. Instead, they were to devote their whole lives to the work of the ministry. When Joseph met Jesus, his Levite calling was restored. He sold that piece of property and he laid the proceeds at the apostles' feet and he became a minister in God's new temple, the church. You know, Zacchaeus experienced that same kind of restoration of identity. Zacchaeus was born a son of Abraham. His name means pure. When Jesus met him, the life that Zacchaeus living was far askew from what God had meant him to be. He was a thief and he was a crooked agent of the Roman government. But Zacchaeus' encounter with Jesus produced inside of him a generosity towards God that restored his identity. Beloved, generosity toward God is what each one of us has been created for. We weren't created for meagerness and we weren't created for stinginess. We were created for abundance and generosity and multiplication. Generosity toward God not only restores your identity, it releases you into your destiny. Joseph never went back to the island of Cyprus. Instead, he spent the rest of his life ministering to the church, discipling and encouraging, restoring, strengthening. Joseph became one of the main characters and main heroes in the book of Acts. Without Barnabas, there would have never been the ministry of the Apostle Paul. Without Barnabas, there would have never been a gospel mission to the Gentile world. Without Barnabas, there would have never been a restored John Mark to carry on the torch of the gospel to the second generation of believers after the apostles died. And all of that began with an offering. Who knows what doors you might be opening up in your life with the next offering that you give to God. Beloved, I want to tell you, when you tithe, you are investing in future open doors in your life. And not only your life, but in the life of your kids and your future generations. Generosity toward God releases God's favor on you. People will be attracted to you. People will want to be near you. They'll want to be with you. They'll value you. They'll want to be like you. Because of his love for the church, the apostles gave Joseph the nickname Barnabas. It means the encourager, the strengthener, the exhorter. I wonder, when people come away from you, do they regard you as an encourager? When people come away from spending time in your presence, do they come away refreshed? Do they come away reinforced in their faith? Do they come away more in love with Jesus and his body? Or do they come away doubting and skeptical and distrusting? Beloved, let me tell you, your good works are no good at all in God's eyes if the result of being in your presence is bad fruit in people's lives. Be an encourager. Ananias and Sapphira also sold a piece of property. And they brought a large gift and they laid it at the apostles' feet. But just like Cain, their gift was rejected by the Lord. Not because of the amount of the gift, but because of the contents of their heart. They didn't give with the sincerity of Barnabas and the other believers. They gave with the hopes of getting ahead. They gave with hopes of gaining recognition and stature. They wanted their own nickname like Barnabas. They thought that was neat. They gave to advance their own agenda. They didn't give to honor God, but to manipulate men. Beloved, big givers can either be a big blessing or they can create big problems. But the way to choose progress for us 
is to keep our love relationship fresh with Jesus so that our heart remains generous towards God. Three ways that we can choose progress and not problems. Three ways that we can choose progress and not problems. The second one is this. We can choose purity of heart. We can choose purity of heart. Jesus said, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Purity of heart means a heart that is undivided in loyalty to God. It means a heart that is undiluted, unmixed. Ananias and Sapphira started down the devil's pathway to problems, and at the root of it all was a heart problem. Peter asked Ananias, how is it that Satan has filled your heart? The Hebrew expression that Peter uses here, it means literally, how has Satan come to lay in your heart? These words are interesting on a few levels. First of all, Peter's words tell us that any believer is susceptible to falling under demonic influence. Beloved, I want to tell you, Ananias and Sapphira were most definitely believers in Jesus, and yet they fell under demonic influence. Peter's words don't mean here that they were possessed, but rather they had come under evil influence. Can I tell you that's a frightening possibility for any one of us. Even those who have walked closely with Jesus in the past are not immune. Even those who have been part of the inner circle of the church are not immune. Leaders are not immune. Even those who have given big offerings and done good works are not immune. You know, Peter knew that all too well himself. Hadn't Peter spoken under the influence of Satan when he rebuked Jesus as Jesus began to talk about the cross. And Jesus told Peter that it was the carnal desires of his own heart that had opened the door to the devil. Get thee behind me, Satan. You do not savor the things of God, but instead you savor the things of men. Hadn't Peter sworn like a sailor in Caiaphas' courtyard denying that he even knew Jesus? Peter knew just how easily this thing could happen. I believe that Ananias and Sapphira were saved. In fact, their death may have been a mercy killing on God's part. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 5, he said, if someone has come under Satan's influence and is harming the body of Christ, it's better for his body to be destroyed so that his soul will be saved alive on the last day. If Ananias and Sapphira had been permitted to carry on in their deception, who knows what further damage they might have done to the church and what further decay might have happened in their own souls. Another interesting thing in Peter's words is that they indicate to us that even though Satan may influence us, God holds us each responsible for opening the door to him. Beloved, look at me and may God give you grace. The devil made me do it will not hold any water with God. Acts 5 is a sober warning to us to guard our hearts unless we're vigilant we can easily open the door to our heart and fall under the enemy's influence. Paul said to the Ephesians, give no place for the enemy. That means don't give the enemy any open door in your life. Don't give him any room to operate at all. Don't give him any legal grounds to occupy your premises. Don't give him any foothold in your heart because with him, footholds immediately become strongholds. Beloved, I want to tell you, pride is an open door for the enemy. Ambition is an open door in our heart for the enemy. Jealousy is an open door in our heart for the enemy. It was their open door. Offense, look at me, offense is, isn't only a door, offense is a wide open airplane hanger. When you've been hurt, or when someone you love has been hurt, and you pick up the offense on their part, 
Greed is an open door. Paul said greed is the new idolatry. A controlling spirit is a huge open door. Beloved, I want to tell you, beware of leaders who cannot follow other leaders. Beware of leaders who always know better than everyone else in the church. Beware of teachers who refuse to sit under teaching. Beware of leaders who can't get along in a healthy system of authority and mutual accountability. These men have controlling spirits and they're dangerous. Stubbornness open door. Manipulative tactics, open door. Sin is a giant open door. How is it that Satan has filled your heart? You open the door. A third thing I find in Peter's words is that once Satan gains entrance, he influences us to become his partners in acts that are both disruptive to God's work and self-destructive to us. Once the devil gets in the door of your heart, he fans the flames of hurt and bitterness. He fans the flames of insecurity and envy. He, he fans the flames of entitlement and ambitious desire. And he drops malicious schemes into our mind. Peter said to, to Ananias, how on earth did you come up with this? What made you think of this? Why did you do it? It's because the enemy had influenced his thinking. He drops ridiculous ideas into our head and then he cheers us on all the way till we carry them through. All the believers were of one heart and mind. They were all on the same page except two who had divided hearts and that led to problems. Beloved, listen, I have a word from the Lord for us. It's time that we shut the dough and keep out the devil. Every church has problems. And every church problem can be traced back to someone who developed a heart problem. So how do we make sure that we keep the door shut? How do we make sure that we close the door and we don't give the enemy any foothold? Well, David did it this way. He prayed, God, create in me a clean heart and renew a right spirit in me. Beloved, listen, this is a word from the Holy Spirit. We need to pray that God would shut the door by creating a clean, pure, undivided heart in us and that he would renew a right spirit so that we're operating under the influence of the Spirit of God and not any other spirit. Let's ask the Holy Spirit to give us a pure heart. Three ways that we can choose progress. You doing all right this morning? Can I get you anything? Some hot apple cider? You like a hot cocoa? Anything you like this morning? You know, I'm going to do it one of these days. I'm actually going to, I'm actually going to, I'm going to set you up and I'm going to do it. I'm going to have people come in and surf. We're almost done. Hang with me. We're almost finished. There's no football on today, is there? Three ways to choose progress and not problems. Choose generosity towards God. Choose purity of heart. And finally this, choose reverential love for the body. Choose reverential love for the body of Jesus Christ. Recognize the awesome spiritual authority that has been invested in the church. Beloved, listen to me. One of the most important messages of Acts chapter 5 is that the Holy Spirit is actively engaged in the affairs of his church. The Holy Spirit is keenly aware of what is happening in his church. There is nothing that escapes his notice. He's keenly aware of threats to the unity of the church, and he is directly involved with protecting his church. Ananias and Sapphira's first fatal mistake was that they failed to discern that there is a real current of spiritual authority flowing in the church. Beloved, I want to tell you, the church of Jesus Christ is unlike any other organization on earth. The church is unlike any other club. The church is unlike any other group. The church is unlike any other secular community. We are unlike any other religious community. We have something that no other human organization on earth has, and that is the presence and the participation of the Holy Spirit of God. Now, if you're going to do it, do it. 
The church is the product of the Holy Spirit. Do you know that the Holy Spirit gave birth to the church on the day of Pentecost? The church is his baby. Unity in the church is the work of the Holy Spirit. The church is betrothed to Jesus, and the job of the Holy Spirit is to protect her and prepare her for the wedding. When you mess with the church, you're messing directly with the Holy Spirit. When you threaten the church, the unity of the church, you're disrupting the work of the Holy Spirit. In Matthew chapter 18, Jesus described why the unity of the church is so important. It's because of the awesome authority that God has bestowed upon us when two or three are gathered together in agreement in the name of Jesus. What is at stake with our unity is the power that God has invested in us to bind and loose. What is at stake in our unity is our ability to undo what the devil has done to people. What's at stake is our ability to do real damage to Satan's kingdom and to make God kingdom advance on earth beloved progress for the church means progress for you progress for the church means progress for your family progress for the church means progress for the sick and the bound and the afflicted and the oppressed it means progress for our community it means progress for God's world Acts 5 teaches us again that God regards people's treatment of his church as their treatment of God himself. Beloved, the church is Jesus' own body. If you beat up on the church, you're beating up on Jesus. When Jesus knocks Saul off of his high horse, you remember Saul was a persecutor of the church, and when Jesus knocked him to the ground, he said to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And God holds us each responsible for the way that we conduct ourselves in his body. Peter said to Ananias, you have not lied to men, but to God. You've conspired to test the Holy Spirit. Beloved, let's make sure that we don't put the Holy Spirit to the test. Choose reverential love for the body. Recognize the spiritual nature of leadership in the body. Ananias and Sapphira's sin was not that they kept back some of the proceeds from the sale of property. Peter said, the field was yours to do with whatever you wanted. The proceeds from the sale were yours to do with whatever you pleased. Their sin was not that they had made a financial pledge and then they weren't able to keep it. Their sin was not that some need arose and, and they weren't able to give as much of the proceeds from the sale as they had planned. Their sin wasn't even that they just changed their mind and decided not to give it all. Their sin was the premeditated deception about the nature of their gift in order to gain status in the church. They misrepresented the amount of the sale to make themselves look as equally as generous as Barnabas. Their gift was on par with politicians who step up their charitable giving in election years uh, to make themselves look good to voters. They failed to recognize that leadership positions in the church cannot be bought. They can't be obtained through political posturing or through people pleasing. In Acts 5, the word church appears for the very first time in the book of Acts. It's the word ecclesia. Ecclesia means called out from and called together by God. Interestingly, this is the word in the Old Testament, uh, Greek translation of the Old Testament. This is the same word used for the congregation of Israel. Ecclesia means we are a called out out covenant community called out means we're different from any other organization we do things differently we don't do things the way they do in the world we don't play politics and we don't position ourselves for promotion Ananias and Sapphira failed to recognize the spiritual gifts of their leaders they failed to recognize that their leaders were gifts from God who had gifts from God. Beloved, look at me. Leaders in the church are gifts from God who have gifts from God. Paul said that apostles, 
and prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers are God's gifts to the body. God chooses them. God places them where he wants them and God invests them with spiritual gifts. Actually, I find that Peter was used in three gifts of the Holy Spirit in this incident. First of all, I find that he moved in the gift called word of knowledge. God supernaturally revealed to the mind of Peter that there was deception going on and that the actual sale price of the property was different from what Ananias and Sapphira had claimed. Secondly, Peter moved in the gift called discerning of spirits. God revealed to Peter what was the spirit behind this act? What was the motivation behind this act? Beloved, not every act that looks good on the surface is good underneath. And Peter moved in the gift called word of wisdom. God revealed to him what was about to happen. Now, here are the feet of the men who carried out your husband, and you're going next. Ananias and Sapphira dishonored the feet of the apostles. The practice of laying offerings at the apostles' feet was a sign of submission to their leadership. It was a recognition of the ministry office that they had received from God. Beloved, there is a reason, there's a spiritual reason why when we have great men of God that come to minister here, there's a spiritual reason why I have you bring your offerings and lay them at their feet. It's biblical, and there's a spiritual transaction that is happening. Feet are mentioned seven times in these verses. The first believers laid their offerings at the apostles' feet. Barnabas sold property and he brought the proceeds and he laid it at the apostles' feet. Unbelievers laid their sick at the apostles' feet. But Ananias and Sapphira laid down a deceptive scheme at the apostles' feet and because of it they fell down dead at the apostles' feet. And then the feet of the young men, the next generation of ministers, came in and carried them out to the tomb. Beloved, let's recognize the spiritual authority of our leaders so that we don't end up in the same defeat as Ananias and Sapphira. <laughs> Melissa, you better come help me. That was a bad pun. <laughs> Choose reverential love. The final thing is this. Capture the self-sacrificing heart shared among all believers. Capture the self-sacrificing heart shared among all believers. All of the believers were of one heart and one mind, except two. All of the believers gave voluntarily and generously and sincerely to promote the well-being and the advance of the church, except for two. Ananias and Sapphira didn't have a heart for partnership. They had a heart for self-promotion. They didn't have a heart for God's people. They had a heart for prominence and praise. Do you know what? The root of the whole thing was a lack of love for the church of Jesus Christ. Proverbs said, a lying tongue hates its victim. And what they did in their act, it was not an act of love. It was an act of hatred. They didn't love the church, so God removed them from his church rather dramatically. Do you know people have been making dramatic departures from the church ever since? I've been a believer for 38 years, and I've seen some doozies in my time. But isn't it funny how the church goes on? And not only does the church go on, isn't it funny how the church grows on? Isn't it funny how the church continues to get stronger and stronger? When the Holy Spirit purged, Ananias and Sapphira out of the church, another wave of Holy Spirit activity came upon them. More signs and wonders were done. The fear of God came upon everyone. The apostles began ministering in a level of shadow, healing, anointing that no one had ever seen before. Something else interesting happened when Ananias and Sapphira were removed from the church. The uncommitted stopped worshiping there. It says that they gathered together in Solomon's colonnade, but it says that the rest, the others, the uncommitted,
dared not to join them any longer. People left, and yet the church realized another wave of growth. More and more men and women came to believe on Jesus and were added to their numbers. Beloved, bad things happen in even the best of churches. But in spite of that, the church goes on and the church grows on. Why? Because for every two that might choose to go down the devil's pathway to problems, there are thousands and thousands of others who choose progress instead. Let's be of those who choose progress. Let's be of those who choose generosity toward God, purity of heart, and reverential love for the body of Jesus Christ. Let's choose progress and not problems. Would you stand together on your feet and would you offer the Lord a great big praise in this place this morning? Oh, come on, let's give him a great big praise today. Come on, let's give him a great, great big praise. Hallelujah. Come on, would you say the name of Jesus with me? It's the name above every other name. There's no other name given under heaven by which we must be saved. Come on, let's say the name of Jesus. Jesus, we love you. Jesus, we worship you. Jesus, we magnify you. We honor you. We love you, Lord Jesus. Come on, lift up your voice. My heart will sing 